Right? You know, you know, again, we can do it again. You know, maybe the lunch is not you know, that, that good, or <laughs> you have too much, so it is so good. So, uh, again, good afternoon. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is William Lu. I'm from uh, Chief Telecom, uh, um, local from Taiwan, and uh, we are the biggest uh, carrier data center and also the biggest internet exchange provide operator in Taiwan. And uh, for the lighting talk, I believe you all know that it's supposed to be light, so it's supposed to be timely and interesting and maybe a little bit crazy according to the, um, the, the, the website. But I hope that you can all enjoy the, all the topics because I'm lo really looking forward to hearing from the experts here. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, let's welcome me, uh, Mr. Shishao from Arister. Yes. Let's give him a big applause, please. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Shishao Tsuchiya, uh, Arista Networks Japan. I'd like to quickly introduce OpenConfig and uh, show the demonstration itself. And what is OpenConfig? OpenConfig is an informal working group of the network operators. Uh, they are sharing the goal, motivation of our, uh, their network, more dynamic programming by the SDN. And they are, uh, they are targeting the uh, declarable configuration and the model-driven management operation. They are defining common data model, uh, which is uh, described by the uh, young model. And so uh, if uh, they define the common data model, then the, uh, uh, we can use same data model in the several vendors. And also they are targeting uh, string telemetry. String telemetry, uh, today's network operates operations is by the uh, push pull model by the SNP or CLI or something. But uh, stream telemetry is moving to the uh, push model uh, network operations. Uh, they already defined uh, several uh, data model, uh, like uh, uh, BGP configuration operation and uh, axe ACL and the streaming telemetry. And, uh, OpenConfig is defined the data model, but uh, transport and the remote procedure call are independent. So uh, we can choice any protocol as you like. But uh, most of the uh, principle of the OpenConfig using NetConf and RESTConf, and uh, Google also using GNMI. GNMI is a gRPC network management interface, which uses a common gRPC protocol between the telemetry and the configuration. So, uh, target of OpenConfig is provide common data model, which is independent of the vendor uh, and the generation for the configuration and the stream telemetry. Uh, this uh, figure shows uh, telemetry uh, from several vendors, and also uh, right side uh, figure uh, shows open config configuration model. Uh, so uh, the operator uses same data model to the uh, several vendors. Yeah, the, uh, I'd like to show the demonstration of the open config. Uh, this slide uh, explains uh, open config uh, configuration. Uh, we uh, set up the open config configuration by the uh, management API open config. And also uh, router configuration uh, showing. And we, I already set up uh, router configuration, but I have not set up the router ID. And this is OpenConfig CLI. Uh, this is get information 
of the BGP configuration and also uh, get a BGP configuration per neighbor. And uh, this is uh, readable by the machine, but it is uh, difficult to do the read, read for the people, so human. So uh, I exchange a JSON format. And also, uh, we can set operation for the uh, open config. This is the operation. Uh, I have not set up the root ID, so uh, it shows 0, 0.0.0. .0. So uh, I'll set up uh, set, uh, another root ID and by the set command. And uh, root ID and 10.255.0.0. Maybe five or something. One. Okay. The set. So uh, we define the open config. And uh, back to the CLI and the shows root ID. Uh, then the uh, root, root ID was configured. So this is a demonstration of our open config uh, configuration model. And I'd like to share the uh, telemetry uh, demonstration. Uh, this is not uh, open config telemetry, but uh, it is uh, understand, too easy to understand what is the telemetry, the what is uh, effective of the uh, current network operation. Uh, I'm set up uh, the uh, telemetry of the seven devices. I'd quickly uh, show the demonstration. And this is uh, figure the input error. Uh, as you know, the input error is uh, several difficult to the, uh, sometimes the difficult to the find reason of the, uh, reason of the cause. So uh, if uh, we configure tel telemetry, then the, uh, it is easy to the, uh, find the reason of your uh, input error. And also, also uh, the URI is uh, showing the demonstration, but uh, the video is not work well. So uh, please check the, uh, the URL after the lightning talk. And uh, I'm showing uh, CPU utilization and the count of root, uh, number of root. And uh, as, you may, uh, as you find, uh, it is easy to understand. Uh, it is easy to understand the what, what kind of uh, status on the network, uh, on the uh, seven devices. Okay, my presentation ended. Uh, yeah, uh, open config is a very, uh, very, very interesting technology. It is uh, defined uh, defined a common data model for the several network vendors. And if uh, you have you are interested in this technology, please let me know. Thank you. Wait, so. Uh, yeah, Q&A, &A, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Any questions to Mr. Shishao? No, man. Okay. He will be having another <laughs> oh, speech <yes>. later. <laughs> so, yeah, we, uh, thank you. Yeah, thank yeah you. please. And uh, the next uh, slide is from uh, Niso uh, about the machine learning uh, approach to detect crime patterns. Actually, it's quite interesting, especially in this part of the world. And there was a news, you know, recently about the Taiwanese get caught in China. <laughs> so it's about uh, something something related to this. So I will I will ask you a question about this later. But yeah, let's uh, welcome Mr. Niso for the, his uh, presentation.
Hello, I am Nisal. I am from University of Morotua, Sri Lanka. And uh, this is video of kind of uh, apart from your uh, area, uh, but I have done uh, some kind of uh, independent research about it. But I have an uh, developed system over this one. Uh, why uh, we used to, we have to use the machine learning for uh, crime prediction because there are millions of crimes happening around the world. Until now, there are even now there are millions of crime. This is uh, oh sorry, violent is spelling wrong. Okay, uh, this is in USA in 2015, over 11 million, uh, 1 million crimes there. So why should we predict crime? Because we can utilize the vigilante resources. That means we can uh, utilize the resources, uh, policemen police cars, weapons, we can uh, relocate and uh, reschedule their patrols by uh, identifying the hotspot of happening, most probable uh, place of happening crimes. Uh, there are existing, system, existing systems uh, using this crime prediction. One of the is spreadful is already used by the LAPD and they have showed some progress uh, of predicting crimes and defending them. There are three main parts in crime prediction process, uh, data gathering and classification and clustering and prediction and forecast. Um, data gathering we have done in so many methods. We can done in so many methods. This is a proposal. Uh, the best one is crime records from authorities. Some countries like uh, Chicago, they are maintaining digital records for their crime records. And we can use social media analysis, hashtags, Twitter, Facebook, and IoT devices. And there are shoe pin databases, which uh, explains the, uh, the cr criminals by using their shoe prints and newspaper articles and CDRs, called data records, and DNS and HTML content analysis. Uh, those methods, apart from newspaper data, uh, we can get that from in a digital format. But how can we get uh, extract from, from newspaper articles? In this case, uh, image processing come to the scenes. Nowadays, most of the newspapers are digitally published. We can use crawlers to go through these digital newspapers and identify crime-related articles and store this data in their databases to further usage. Actually, uh, this has been done in one system, and they have used crawler files, which is open source uh, crawler to go through the, these newspaper articles and identify crime-related news and store them. Uh, clustering of data is we can use these methods and, and many other things, but uh, in geographical hotspots identifying, they have done most of the research have, researchers have done these k means. Uh, I know this is a equation, but uh, if we want, I, I can explain it. Uh, this is uh, about the finding the mean or best place, geographical best place. Uh, hotspot of happening crime. Uh, such systems such as Predpol have this guest systems get succeeded. Of course, they have uh, in uh, no cross in Georgia they have using used this kind of a crime prediction software, and they have showed 22.7 reduction of crimes with comparing of 10 months without using this software. Uh, I have seen something, this uh, as my suggestion, uh, in the previous researchers, they have done, uh, they have limited the, their data resources and their analyzing for one, uh, one side. But I think that we can, in, uh, 
interact. This is all machine learning, big data analysis, image processing. I know this is a hard task, but uh, if we use these things together, we can create a more sophisticated system to crime prediction. And thank you. This is my presentation. Any questions? Yeah, like I mentioned, I do have a question, you know. Yeah, I, I believe this kind of application uh, to, uh, to use to uh, prevent or predict crime is uh, very important. Uh, but I also do see, like in our part of the world, the sensitiveness between Taiwan and China. Actually, one of the Taiwanese was get uh, arrested in China in March, and he is not still uh, he's still holding custody because he uh, he he founded a QQ uh, you know WeChat group of chatting and and during the chatting he says you know of course many things but they, 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 he criticized the Chinese government. And then he got arrested because the China government they, they thinks that he is trying to overrule China um, uh, uh, government. So do, do you know how to, uh, being an IT guy or, or a technical person, we, we should do the, uh, all kinds of uh, research or, or ways to prevent crime, but how do we prevent the government from um, abusing them? You know, they use the the information, or even do something before the actual criminal do something. You know? Maybe it's a criminal, but maybe it's not. And although also there's a movie of a, a minority report. Do you know that? I think everybody knows that, right? So how do we prevent the government or law enforcement party to, you know, to, to use it without uh, due diligence? Yeah. Yeah, What's I think. If uh, we uh, gather this data in a, in a very uh, standard manner, I don't think this is going to some, someone's chat is not ethical. Uh, so if we standardize these systems, like if we have, if we can have some kind of policy, to uh, this data will be recorded. This will be data will be used by uh, law enforcement authorities. If we can say that to the public. And the privacy of them also will be protected, and also the uh, crime rate will be reducted. But there will be some incidences. They chatting with uh, others to actually this happened. They have identified uh, some kind of a, a drug smuggling chain, a drug smuggling chain in uh, I don't know the place, but uh, by using these chats. Uh, so I think. If we have a policy, and we have, if we publish them to the public, that will be a most suitable way. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's uh, give a big applause to uh, uh, Niso. And the next uh, speaker is uh, Masataka Sang, right? Yeah. Great to see you again. <laughs> and um, you're talking about uh, the sharing with us with uh, about the foreign countries uh, operation. So uh, let's all hear from uh, Masataka san. Thank you. Uh, thank you for introduction. I'm Masataka Matari from uh, Japan Internet Exchange, JPIX. Uh, my lightning talk is uh, chat and operation with operators in foreign country region. And uh, in this presentation, uh, I'd like to share uh, my experience uh, about uh, usual work with uh, other country uh, network engineers. Uh, firstly, uh, this slide is introduction. Uh, as you all uh, know, uh, you all uh, usually work uh, with your uh, customer, uh, uh, no, no, uh, your team uh, on a company or a community uh, with uh, chat applications. Uh, Slack, uh, Chatwork, HipChat, or something else. Uh, I think uh, recently such working style is uh, standard. 
But uh, on the other hand, uh, what do you do uh, with uh, people uh, out of uh, company or communities? Uh, telephone, uh, email, or uh, chat, uh, even uh, uh, other company. And by the way, uh, let me introduce about JPX new members. Uh, the uh, organization uh, is uh, 14 uh, in this year, since the beginning of uh, 2017. Uh, but uh, 20 out of 40 are foreign-owned uh, companies. Uh, you thought uh, it's uh, something like a commercial talk, uh, but it's important of uh, my lightning talk presentation. Uh, that's why this means uh, the percentage of members based in time zone other than Japan standard time, JST, is increasing. Uh, this uh, different of time zone uh, have uh, some impact uh, on our uh, operation and work. Especially uh, the customers uh, is based on uh, US or uh, Europe. Uh, the uh, different of uh, time is very big. So uh, one side uh, of between us and uh, our customer uh, isn't uh, business uh, hours. So uh, one side is business time, uh, but uh, another side uh, it's uh, midnight or uh, very early morning. Uh, and uh, some other uh, working style uh, has uh, different. So uh, we always uh, use uh, chat application when uh, we do uh, activate a new IX port of JPX or upgrade uh, of IX port. Uh, we use a chat application. Uh, it's very useful. And uh, I have researched uh, the chat application. Uh, as you can see, uh, Skype or Google Hangouts uh, more popular uh, than other uh, applications. Uh, as you can see, uh, many uh, variety, uh, Skype Hangouts, Cisco WebEx, HipChat, uh, Skype, and uh, some operators uh, uh, want to use email only or telephone. And uh, it, might not, it might not be an issue for communication among uh, foreign country region engineers. Uh, I think it's difficult that everybody fit into one chat system. Uh, but if talking about IX port activation and BGP peering operation, uh, we usually use uh, peering DB. Uh, I think uh, you all know it. Uh, peering DB is very useful for, for uh, BGP engineer or uh, IX engineer. Uh, so uh, I think if peering DB has chat function, uh, it's more useful for them. Uh, IX engineer will create a chat room on Piano DB uh, and then send an invitation to engineer of IX patch plant as a guest. Uh, this is uh, final slide. Uh, if Piano DB would have chat function, uh, we could be more happy. 
uh, that means the number of times to access to PyDB will increase. And then when providers connect to new export or turn up new BGP session, uh, they also have some information to update in PyDB. Uh, finally, uh, I hope that information in peering DB will be more uh, updated uh, and reliable. Especially, uh, the number of prefix uh, is uh, important uh, information, uh, other information. Uh, it's for BGP route uh, filtering. Uh, BGP network engineer uh, configure uh, to refer uh, this information uh, on uh, root filtering. Uh, that's it. Uh, thank you for your attention. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, any questions? Yes, please. Hi, uh, Don Samban, director, um, journalist from Disruptive Asia. Question on um, censorship and the various chat apps. Um, I've got everyone in Thailand uses Line. Everyone in Singapore seems to use WhatsApp. Um, everyone in the Bitcoin community in uh, Singapore uses WeChat because WhatsApp can't talk to China. Um, because it's banned. And then you've got sort of all the other permutations of other countries with, with various banned chat apps. How is that a problem? Because you, you mentioned a few, but you never mentioned the way some apps are banned in some countries. And have you come across that? Uh, I'd, I'd like your thoughts. Thank you. Uh, uh, good point. Uh, Actually, uh, we have uh, customers in China, uh, mainland. Uh, their company uh, would like to use uh, WeChat uh, on uh, connecting to our exchange. So, uh, but uh, on, on that moment, uh, we uh, 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 recommend uh, uh, to use uh, Skype. Uh, actually, uh, we can uh, use uh, WeChat, uh, but uh, uh, I don't experience um, WeChat uh, using. So uh, that uh, that time on that time. Uh, we use uh, Skype uh, between uh, China company engineer and us. So uh, important point uh, is uh, many, many application on uh, chat or texting. So uh, BGP or IX engineer uh, will be uh, uh, most to work, uh, I, uh, my idea is uh, Pying Davy uh, will have a chat or something like a system. Thank you. OK, uh, any more, qu more questions? Actually, I, I do find this uh, topic very interesting because I'm, <laughs> we are also running an IX. So yeah, th uh, let's uh, give. Uh, Mr. Um, Masataka-san, a big applause. And this is, uh, yeah, uh, good for you. And to, uh, by the way, to all the speakers, we are going to have a group photo later, so please don't go away, you know, wait until the session ends, please. And next, uh, uh, well, I'm going to welcome uh, Mr. Uh, Ms. Shayek. Shayek? Yeah, a beautiful lady, but I don't really know how to pronounce. It's the first time I should know her a few years ago. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's welcome uh, Ms. Shakayak. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Shakayak, and um, today I'm going to share successes and challenges of IPv6 transition at APNIC. So I'm going to talk about dual stack NetPT, 
as well as IPv6 only Wi-Fi, which we implemented in APNIC network. So APNIC has been running dual stack um, network using public IPv4 and IPv6 addresses for so many years. So this year, APNIC decided to reduce uh, the number of uh, public IPv4 addresses that it's using to return them um, to the free pool for community use. So we decided to achieve um, this goal. We decided to implement NatPT in our LAN network. So this is the logical diagram of the um, network that we implemented NAT. So NAT has been implemented in site one um, based on this diagram. So uh, each router, uh, at site one is configured with a separate range of public IP addresses for IPv4 inside global that you can see the example of the configuration of that. So to achieve um, this setup uh, during the implementation, we had a couple of uh, challenges. So the first challenge was NAT need, uh, needed to be done on site at site one where um, the client reside. But um, the router are not, the routers at site ones are not the gateway to the upstream, which um, is where NAT is usually implemented. And another uh, challenges uh, that we face during the implementation is that um, uh, no NAT was to be done uh, between the uh, in the organization. So no translation was to be done between different sites in the organization. So. To deal with these challenges, we used an uh, access list, a route map, and prefix list to filter out all uh, internal IP addresses between three sites uh, that they are not affected by NAT. So all of the prefixes are sorted into group object. And the route map was uh, used to match access list to the NAT address pool. Finally, the prefix list was used along with OSPF to route the NAT uh, pool to the gateway routers. Uh, here is an example of the configuration of the uh, access list, prefix list to uh, achieve this goal. Another challenge is that we faced after implementing NAT PT User, uh, users report reconnection at approximately two minutes intervals uh, towards external sites where they were using UDP services, uh, let's say, such as uh, Apple Music. So to deal this, with this issue, we increased UDP timeout. And after increasing UDP timeout, this uh, issue fixed. So you know dynamic translation timeout after a peri period of uh, non-use. So when port trans translation is not configured, translation entries timeout after 24 hours. So this time can be adjusted uh, using this uh, configuration on the router. IPv6 only Wi-Fi. We launched our IPv6 only Wi-Fi on World IPv6 Day this year. Uh, this is the logical diagram of the IPv6 only Wi-Fi network. So we have DNS64, we have the NAT64 uh, in this diagram. So DNS64 is to serve um, and to use for by nine. And NAT64 router to a separate range of public addresses for NAT64 pool. Uh, in this setup, uh, we used um, a, a stateless address auto configuration for IPv6 addresses. Uh, I can say IPv6 only Wi-Fi had some successes in our network. So we tested IPv6 only Wi-Fi to a variety of devices, range of Mac OS, Yosemite, Sierra, Macintosh, um, and um, 
Windows 7 and 10, and a mix of Linux and um, kernel versions. So all of them worked well with this setup. And of course, we faced some challenges uh, for mobile users. Some of the mobile uh, devices didn't work, and they were receiving uh, error for obtaining IPv6 uh, IP addresses and they timeout. So we initially thought that uh, those devices are incapable of uh, using IPv6. But uh, with a quick Google research, this theory dismissed. So the next uh, thing was comparing a version of the mobile devices that uh, we were using. So these devices that they were not working with the IPv6 only network, they were uh, Android devices. So we chose two devices with the same Android version, but with two different manufacturer. One of them, they. Um, it was working well, and one of them not. So uh, it wasn't the version. So after a couple of research and challenges, we enabled recursive DNS server, RDNSS, defined in RFC 6106 on the router. And with this setup, it worked well. And this is the example of the configuration. Uh, during the implementation of the IPv6 only network, so there are uh, things to watch out for um, when connecting to a different types of server. Even though you have a server that have IPv6 addresses, ensure its services are listening to IPv6. Besides this, some of the application is still not working with IPv6 only network. So we couldn't, we, we have not got Spotify. Skype and Zoom working on IPv6 only network. So there are some articles that uh, uh, some issues they have with IPv6, and we are working on that. So uh, what does it all mean? So for our network setup, for the diagram that I showed you in my first slide, uh, IPv6, implementing IPv6 only network, it was very simple and it worked well for us. So it doesn't need any special requirements for uh, fixing route map and prefix lists. And uh, the last sentence that I want, I want to say, the more that people use IPv6 only, the more vendors will be forced to produce more IPv6 compatible devices and services. And we will uh, continue to share our experience for IPv6 only Wi-Fi uh, in APNIC block. So you can share your experience as well. Thank you. Thank you. So any questions? Yes. Hmm. Uh, Professor Wu. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Aaron. Um, my question is, uh, you mentioned that UDP timeout interval is extended. Yes. Uh, because uh, at first it has some timeout problem. Yes. Could you be more specific to tell us the new uh, timer is extended to how many minutes? So uh, if you go back to my slide. So we are still ex um, experimenting uh, this issue. So. Uh, I can say we fixed this issue just a couple of uh, weeks ago with uh, this timer that we put uh, in our configuration, and seems it's working well. So this is the current setup. So if we face more issue for the, the UDP timeout, we may need to change this timeout uh, to the different uh, time. But until now, after changing this configuration, it worked well. Thank you. Okay, uh, any more questions? Okay, thank you, uh, Ms. Shayak. Shayak? Shayak? Okay, I need to practice more, sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, the next uh, speaker is fr uh, from uh, Laura's uh, Cloud Service, uh, CEO, Mr. Han Lu, about IP as uh, infrastructure. Let's uh, welcome Ms. Mr. Han Lu.
Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Lu Hen. Uh, I come from uh, Hong Kong. Uh, work for a small company focused on IP addresses management and uh, trading. So today I'm going to present an idea for a separate IP from the rest of your infrastructure in order to gain few advantages uh, in, all, uh, in both commercial sense as well as technical sense. So let's get started. Okay, how it works? The green one, the green one okay. So uh, what we advocate here is we, we separate IP from rest of the infrastructure. So we provided an internal, uh, it can be through VPN or OpenVPN or any, any, any type of internals to assign your IP from a remote data center, let's say in the cloud. So that way uh, you will get a uh, provide neutral IP addresses, so which means uh, for example, in your office, uh, if you set up a web server in your office and uh, or a mail server in your office, uh, you solely rely on the ISPs, your local ISP, which provide a single cable line to your office to make your web server or your email server work at your office. And if we able to provide you an extra layer of infrastructure, uh, put in additional IP address in the cloud, you will have two lines of, uh, you are able to you know, subscribe to two, two type of differences, for, for example, ADSL or cab cable fiber, uh, both into office have a redundancy. And uh, it's give you freedom of choice, of course. Uh, it will help you to choose different uh, providers for your infrastructure because IP address was provided on the cloud, therefore you're not tied to your connectivity providers. Uh, it's also CGN proof. So CGN is a very interesting case uh, for the for the IPS infrastructure idea because in in in, in uh, you know in the in the area where you per place carrier grid net into your network, your end users are no longer receive and um, public IP addresses. But let's face it, not every, not every single end user would need a public IP addresses. So separate them from your current layer of, of infrastructure, just give them a simple VPN and give them an, assign them a static IP from the cloud instead of configure into your current infrastructure to the minority needs of some of your users would need a static IP at home would be uh, very number one very easy idea number two it's very easy uh, very very simple to implement number three it's very cost effective uh, we have some of the large deploy, deployment experience with uh, medium to small ISP in the area uh, to help them to uh, separate layers of their infrastructure to uh, from the IP addresses. Uh, so the guys uh, doing this uh, are mostly small businesses and home users. So they not rely on the ISP addresses. They, uh, it's very easy for them to migrate from one ISP to another if you're not happy with your, with your current ISP service at your office. You can simply change another one because the IP wasn't provided by them in the first place. Uh, and the, your physical layer become trans, uh, your physical carrier layer become transparent, obviously, because the end connection term, termination point is on the cloud, is on the data center, which is the IP provider. So you basically uh, then show your actual physical carriers. Uh, so let's talk about a little more about a physical layer abstract. Uh, physical layer are, are no, no, no longer absolutely needed. IP become constant and permanent because the IP was provided by an independent provider of the IP address instead of tied to connectivity bandwidth, your infrastructure location. Uh, therefore, if you migrate your service from one location to another, there is no migration, no reconfiguration needed. You just migrate a server, your IP, or if you have a DNS, everything stays the same, no renumbering needed whatsoever. And uh, 
freedom of choice, of course, there's no local loop changes, uh, no longer imply to migration. Fail over provides simply imply having a uh, connection traffic will go through. So, I mean, in the most extreme case, as we said here, uh, if a, connection, a cable connection at your office fails, you can put a 4G or LTE connection there, you know, just from your mobile phone, really. Uh, you still have your web server up running at the same IP addresses, at the uh, same connection. Your DNS server still works same. You do not need to reconfigure your DNS by that way. Uh, and CGN is a very large topic, especially in this region, that many ISPs actually implement the CGN, including some of the biggest ISPs on the planet. Uh, ISP moving to a CGN will have no impact to the end user connectivity who would like to host a game server at home, for example, or need to end point-to-point -point connection to home. That, but we do understand CGN does provide you ability to configure at your current layer of network. However, separate your current layer, but provide an extra layer to the cloud uh, by connect to the IP addresses on the cloud would uh, free your current, uh, free your net, net, network complexity as well as much easier for billing and the management for the minority users who need point-to-point -point connections. And uh, the enterprise solution. So we see more and more mobile users. I mean, the mobile user has been exploded in past decades. I mean, actually, this morning we actually have just had the Apple 10 years anniversary presentation for the new iPhone since it first came out 10 years ago. So the mobile user became the very important part of all businesses. And uh, mobile users from day one don't receive a static IP addresses. And by providing an extra layer, layout of IP address, so let them connect to a terminal, get an IP from the cloud, that will enable mobile users have a point-to-point -point connection at all time, at all locations. And uh, it's, of course, will also simplify your network management regardless of the location. It's same static IP, same rights and uh, rules as, as, as whatever you prefer to configure it. Uh, so we do have uh, in-house ready software for, for such a deploy deployment. Uh, we test on the large user bases. Uh, it's unique static IP provided by us or can be provided by uh, uh, by the ISPs or anyone who use our service. We just provide software solutions and you can provide infrastructure as well as the IP address if you like to. But we do can, we also can provide you a static IP in case you need it. Uh, we also help you do the network integration. We tested for uh, multiple user cons uh, consequence agents as well as uh, mobile providers. We also tested for uh, different offices who want to have a remote office concentrated together that have been assigned public IP to different locations of their offices. We also did that for uh, our customers. So with VPN solution, uh, which provides IP address in the cloud separate from your current physical infrastructure, it's uh, greatly reduce your IP address dependency, being true dependent uh, by a sense of you can renum you don't need to ever renumbering, you uh, don't need to change your IP address for your DNS server ever again, you don't need to rely to your current connectivity providers or the quality of your connectivity or even your, your current conditions of your local uh, weather, for example. You can simply have a backup far away in Los Angeles, Frankfurt, and still have uh, your main uh, operation base at your office. You know, if there's, for example, like today, Typhoon in your office area and you get better connectivity in your office, you can simply switch to your remote locations without changing the IP addresses. That's really convenient and increase your efficiency. And uh, thank you very much. Any questions? No? Okay. Hey, hey, wait, wait, wait. I, I do have a question. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, it's not because I'm moderator, but because my company actually also provides a VPN service. Okay. Okay, so we, we do see a lot of transition from the uh, uh, MPS VPN to uh, Internet VPN, okay? But the, the, I think your presentation or your net technology or your service based on the IP, the, the, the user owns the IP, or they still need to get it from the ISP, which if you don't apply uh, some service from ISP, the ISP will not give you an IP. Or they got IP from you, <laughs> then they are, 
they are uh, provider neutral, but they are not no service provider neutral because they need to use your service. So that, what, what's your opinion on that? Uh, so that's exactly correct. So our, our product comes to a few 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 seg segments. We do provide ISP with the software solution. So yes, then the end user need to get get IP address from the end customers. However, uh, we also provide IP. So we do provide a service to the end users. Yes, we, the end user is still not service provider neutral, but because our services seated in multiple data centers with any cost solutions. So basically the users, you know, we are more stable than a local cable provider, number one. Number two, because we only provide IP address, we're not providing them connectivity, we're not tied to local fiber. So in that sense that their uh, physical layer of connective provider can be neutral and that's most important because, I mean, IP address is IP address, that is a simple number we're sent to users, that's the most stable thing you know, in the whole chain of uh, infrastructure. Your server can broken, your fiber cable can broken. Uh, there's a lot of things that can go wrong with your physical infrastructure, just the IP number will not go wrong. And most of the time, the outside world really just need to know your IP numbers. They don't really need to know anything about which brand of server you're using or what connectivity providers they use. They just need, need to know which IP to, you, to reach you. So that's our idea to separate the IP addresses from your existing infrastructure. So make the one which the identifier, which is m the most important thing for outside world to reach you, separate from the, your physical infrastructure, make it truly independent and stable. Does that make it answer your question? Yes, yes, Okay, yes. appreciate that. Thank you. So, any more questions? Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Liu. <laughs> okay. Uh, our next uh, presentation is uh, about uh, SIP, uh, voice, no, VOIP. So, um, the topic is generalized code release code for SIP based communication. I hope that I can say I understand it because we, our company also provide the VIP service, but I don't really. So I look forward to uh, listen to Mr. Shai Samia. Yeah, uh, let's uh, welcome Ms. Samia. Samia, I'm from Bangladesh. Uh, I'm working for a VIP gateway provider company, and uh, my topics is generalized call realist code for SIP-based telecommunication service. Uh, this presentation is not pure technical; rather, I will share some observation from my job sector and. Uh, 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 brief proposal how the issues could be resolved. Uh, in our company, what we do is provide the gateway service for VIP call uh, to enter or exit uh, Bangladesh. Okay. Uh, our uh, national telecommunication network is based on SS7, GSM, and 3G. Uh, we received voice call from outside world via SAFE protocol and passed to our downstream network, which is ISAP network. Uh, the problem we faced to maintain a better quality of service is ambiguity among cost code of SIP protocol and mapping to ISAP network codes. Suppose a normal and a usual uh, phone call is released with normal call clearing, uh, cost code 16, uh, uh, in ISAP side, but there is no corresponding code in SIP-based call. Uh, there is said, uh, normal call release 16 uh, calls result in general with a buy or cancel message, but there is no code for it. There is only 200 OK messages, but it is generalized OK message, not an uh, 
indication for normal clearance. Then, uh, if there is audio codec mismatch between uh, ingress and uh, ingress or egress side from SIP side, we uh, get 403 forbidden. 503 service unavailable, uh, which is uh, translated to ISAP in 41 temporary failure, 57 uh, bearer capability not authorized. But 403 and uh, 503 is very serious cause code, uh, but actually this issue is just configuration mis uh, mistake or a missing codec in the list. Uh, you can see more than uh, five ISAP calls code is uh, mapped to SIP, uh, SIP code 503 service unavailable and 403 forbidden. Uh, like uh, 34, no circuit unavailable, unavail uh, 38, uh, network out of order, temporary failure, failure 41, 42, switching, uh, uh, switch equipment uh, concession, resource unavailable, bearer capability non-presently available. This solar goes for 503 service unavailable. Uh, and uh, also for 403 forbidden, uh, 55 ISAP, 57, uh, 21, 87, those are for uh, incoming calls barrier within CUZ, barrier capability not authorized, call rejected, user not member of CUZ. They all are of different condition in ISAP side, but in SIP, in SIP side, they become one. Uh, though practical result remains same, the call is failed either for service side or client side fault. This ambiguity is uh, SIP uh, cost code result to uh, QoS degradation, and hence customer complaints start flooding, which impact the support. Uh, so why don't we make some code for such scenario when, we, uh, when both ISAP and SIP are present? It will be reject, uh, no sorry, it will be uh, reduce significant time to find our uh, extent reason and location in case to failure resulting a very smooth operation. Uh, in, the res in the result, so we can uh, uh, find the smile from the customer. This is all from me, actually. This is a uh, problem we faced, and we are funding the solution. So I'm talking about these things. Thank you. Any question from your side? Anyone? Any questions? OK. Uh, uh, yes? Yes, please. Uh, excuse me, um, uh, Aaron again. So you are uh, proposing that um, you want to study the topic to map the cancel calls uh, from ISAP to SIP. A am I correct? Uh, yeah, I'm proposing that there is a standardized ISAP and SIP cost code. Both, not this, that one can uh, caused by others so that, the, uh, that we can map the similar one. Okay. Um, but uh, so if you, uh, I believe a company called Dialogic, uh, they deliver um, SIP and ISAF gateway. So which is, uh, uh, they deliver quite a lot of equipment for that. They already defined a table of mapping. Yeah, they have the mapping. We're using their switches uh, for our downstream ISAF uh, side. And otherwise, uh, and in the SIP side, we are using the Catalia switches. But when, in customer side, we face uh, the problem for cost code. Because uh, I mentioned before that uh, in, uh, under the 503, we have five ISAP cost code. So if the call is failed for the network, but it shows also the 503 cost code in SIP side. Right, I'm, I want to, um, I just telling that we need to uh, minimize this problem. So uh, you think uh, their mapping is not enough, and you want to create more cost call? Is yeah. that? Yeah. Okay. Thank All you. The different uh, standardized for both. Anyone oh. more? Yeah. Anyone? Any questions? Okay. 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. Okay, uh, we are going to uh, welcome um, uh, Shisha Sang again for the show tech. I don't really understand what show tech is, but I hope uh, after this uh, right. presentation I can learn from him. Okay. Thank you. Okay, again, she should see again. And uh, the presentation title is uh, What is Show Tech uh, from a Genog Case Study. Um, I'd like to share the, our Japan Network Operation Group the, uh, experience to the APNIC people. Uh, who are my, uh, I, I'd like to quickly explain my uh, job history. I, I'm studied um, my uh, career from uh, Rico Techno Systems, who is a maintenance company, uh, not only uh, their copier system, but also network equip equipment like a Cisco or uh, Yamaha or something. And after that, I joined the Cisco, uh, uh, and uh, I started Arista in the, this year. And what is Showtech? Uh, Showtech is a CLI command, uh, is a show technical support, which is set of the maintenance command to investigate root cause of the trouble, like a uh, uh, show version, uh, show IP root, show running configuration, and the show inventory or something. Back to the 2008, Janog uh, 22, uh, Max uh, Mitsugi-san, who is data center operator, uh, she did the presentation is what is show tech. She already understanding it is important, but why it is mandatory. Uh, I'd like to quickly explain the, our uh, situation. In Japan, uh, most of the vendor uh, cannot sell uh, our equip equipment to the operator directly. Uh, we are basically indirect, indirect sales model. Uh, so, uh, vendor and manufacturer have to the sell to the system the integrator, and the system the integrator have to the sell to the operator. And uh, in the maintenance case, uh, if the uh, network equipment has the trouble, then the uh, operator have to the uh, report to the system integrator, and the system integrator have to the report to the uh, manufacturer and the vendors. So, uh, see, the system integrators are always requesting to correct Showtech in uh, every case. So, uh, she is wondering, uh, she have to the correct Showtech in every case. Uh, for example, uh, these already shows in the log message for, for example, sh CPU hog. Uh, so, uh, the network node is reloaded. And the physical failure, uh, fan noise, and the SV. SFP laser failure by dust or something. And uh, they already recovered from cr critical failure. And uh, if you, the, in that case, uh, system integrator requests a short take, then the, uh, they are aware of the side effect of the short take. So uh, she uh, takes survey to the vendor and the manufacturer, uh, short take is mandatory or not. And is there side effect by the show tech and the reason of uh, display that to terminal? Uh, show tech is share command. And uh, if uh, are we execute the show tech, then the, uh, a lot of uh, command is the display. This is answer of the, uh, the survey. Uh, show tech is mandatory or not. Uh, this is not mandatory, but desirable uh, for the uh, for the, vendor, for the vendor point of view, uh, because it can get same quality uh, information from the uh, system, uh, network, uh, from the operators. And is there a side effect by the show tech? Uh, show tech is, show tech's priority of the process is low, so uh, it is uh, difficult, uh, so it is not so many, uh, uh, so many trouble, but it access to the memory and the CPU. So uh, side effect would be uh, possible. And the uh, reason of this display the terminal, uh, the reason is uh, uh, consumer of the disk space. 
and uh, it's the uh, the Showtech have uh, several subset options to minimize uh, Showtech uh, IPSF or something, Showtech OSPF something, and also it can redirect to the, the hard disk or flash on the URL. So uh, after the uh, mailing list discussion and the presentation, she wrap up the wish list about Showtech from operator point of view. Uh, hidden security information, lo like uh, login and the SNMP community, BGPMD5, and the interface description. Uh, she is always remove these information from Showtech information. And execute time should be a short thing, and the impact of the CPU should be uh, minimized. Don't need display the monitor and need several subset option. And she back to the uh, Janog 40 uh, in this year. Uh, she's uh, presentation title is Don't be afraid of the show tech. She takes the survey again to the operator and manufacturer and vendor and uh, what kind of information sent to SI manufacturer to the request for an analysis and uh, any concerns point when send the show tech, uh, any concern when they get show tech, any technique when they uh, get the show tech. Is there any whole waiting command? Because uh, show tech uh, sometimes impact to the CPU and the memory. So uh, several, vendor, uh, several network operator has a hidden command, whole waiting command uh, in the operation. So uh, she takes survey to the uh, operator. And uh, they, uh, she also uh, take a survey to the uh, vendors, uh, improvement architecture point to the reduce load of CPU and memory to get show tech. The improvement point to the get logging and technique for analysis of the failure. There is uh, uh, several answers, but uh, I'd like to introduce uh, some implementation example. Uh, this is, uh, this is architecture improvement. Uh, all side operation system, every, every uh, CLI always access to the process by itself. So uh, it, it, it has a side effect of the CLI. But uh, current, uh, the, this implementation is process does not have a network state, and network state always saves on the central database. So uh, side effect, no, uh, no side effect by the CLI. And there is a, a command scheduler to the execute CLI by regularly, and the show tech execute by hour, and the save the zip the result to the data to the flash by default. And uh, event-based script, uh, there is an event-based script. For, for example, if an interface is down, then the uh, script is uh, started and to get uh, show tech. And uh, also important information like uh, root, remove, at, uh, can save and refer as SQL write, uh, write database. It is, uh, this is, uh, uh, the, Depend on the network operation system, the architecture, but this is example of implementation. Oh, oh, plus, I, maybe I had uh, last slide, but it is, uh, <laughs> was removed. So uh, I'd like to uh, explain uh, quickly. Uh, ah, this way, uh, no, uh, sorry. And uh, uh, so, listen from the Janog 22 and Janog 40. Uh, network architecture and operation is changing and uh, improvement. So, uh, like, uh, and uh, the most important point is network operator and uh, vendors. Uh, the intercommunication is uh, important because uh, uh, because because uh, understanding of uh, how the how the vendors 
uh, understanding operation is very important. Also, uh, understanding uh, ne current network architecture understanding is uh, important for the network operator. Okay, uh, the, my presentation ended. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Okay. Uh, thank you, Shishou-san. Yes? Huh? You have questions? Oh, okay. Can Sorry. I have a question? Yeah, we do Mr. have a question, and we still have got uh, enough time. Yeah, okay. so, yeah, please. A quick question. Mr. Skia? Skia, okay. <laughs> Uh, my question is, uh, as you said, you mean the show tag has no CPU impact, right? It depends on the uh, network operations. System. Yeah, so ne network operations. How about the show maintenance debug BGP, for example? Oh. Yeah, is it um, network operation impact when the service, uh, service is on? It, 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 it is uh, deeply depend on the operation system. But uh, our network operation system is not impact to the uh, to the our OS. Debug command is not impact to the our OS because uh, every event keeping on the logging database. So it is depends on architecture. So supposedly the architecture is right, then there's yeah. no impact, right? Yeah. It's yeah. already logged. logged. Okay. Any more questions? Okay, thank you. Yeah, let's uh, give uh, Shizu a, a, a big applause. And uh, then uh, uh, I think it's the last, right? The last uh, um, presentation from uh, Ms. Shakayak. Shakayak? Yeah, about the conference network of uh, the APNIC 44. We thank uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Shekayek for her uh, sharing. Uh, good afternoon again. So as part of the uh, APNIC technical team, I'm going to share conference uh, network setup uh, with you on this session. Um, Network for webcasting for YouTube Live and Adobe and also guest Wi-Fi that you are using uh, during this conference has been set up by APNIC technical team. Uh, we have Tronga Telecom HiNet as transit provider. We have two uplink, one gig uh, bandwidth per uplink, which is great. And we are using dual stack, full BGP feed, V6 and V4 on this conference. And so we are using APNIC network um, prefixes, IP prefixes for the meeting key. This is the logical diagram uh, that we are using for each APNIC conference. We have two co-router um, for redundancy, and also we usually have two upstream provider and two BGP session. This is physical diagrams that we used uh, for setup APNIC 44 network. Um, we used hotel uh, infrastructure, uh, accessing uh, to patch panel for each data point on each room. So in this conference, in this venue, there are three server rooms that we put our main rack in the main server room. We are using uh, two core router for redundancy, two core uh, switch for redundancy, and also DNS, and um, uh, monitoring uh, servers, and also DHCP server for redundancy, and two wireless control controller. For other server rooms in level 13, so we put our access switches to access to each data point uh, on each room for uh, conference area. And also, this is the physical diagram that we put our access point on each room or switches, access switches as needed per each room. 
the equipment that we are using, we are using Cisco router ISR and also 7201. Cisco switches, C380, 3850 stack switches, and also access switches. We are using Cisco wireless controller and Aeronet uh, Wi-Fi access point. Uh, by enabling profiling and application visibility on uh, wireless controller, I've collected some statistics um, uh, about the clients and OS that they are using and also applications that, and that they are using during the conference. So surprisingly, Microsoft Workstation 24% is on the top, Android, um, Apple iPhone, and OS X Workstation 11%. So besides Android 90%, we have Android, Samsung, Galaxy, 4% as well. <laughs> and also for uh, application visibility, uh, we, it depends um, on the session and during um, uh, per session, there are different applications are using. So the top one is Adobe Connect, which, is, which we are using for um, webcasting, one of our uh, webcasting things. Uh, so, uh, after that, maybe Facebook is on the top. So far, uh, we reached to 341 client, uh, concurrent client for uh, connecting to our controller. This is bandwidth consumption so far. Um, the maximum one reached to 100 meg. And also, we set up NetFlow uh, to capture IPv4, IPv6 traffic ratio. So IPv6 maximum uh, reached to eight, 80 meg, so average three, 30 to 40. And IPv4 reached to 100, and average between 60 to 80. Uh, of course, we used a uh, monitoring system, uh, monitoring server to monitor our network infrastructure during the conference. We used this like SNMP uh, using Libra NMS uh, to uh, collect um, device health check, uh, bandwidth usage, um, access point, um, and clients per access point, and per, um, traffic for the wireless controller. And also, we used um, NetFlow to capture uh, traffic for IPv4 and IPv6 specifically. Uh, I would like to say thank you to Changwa Telecom Hynet technical team. So some of them, they are not in this photo, but uh, they help us a lot um, for network setup and also support. Um, I would like to uh, say thank you to TW Unique Technical Engineer, Mark, uh, which helped us a lot during the setup and also during the conference. And Splendor Hotel Tech Team that helped us a lot uh, to set up each room for cabling, for setup, accessing to patch panel. Um, and I would like uh, to say that without helping uh, from Tronga Telecom, uh, TW Unique uh, Tech Team, and Espl Splendor, we couldn't achieve this. So this is my presentation uh, about APNIC 44 network setup. Thank you. Do you have any question? Yes, I think two. Yeah, please. What was the percent of devices that had IPv6 support? Sorry? The percent of devices that had IPv6 support. So you gave us the traffic, the net flow, the yep. ratios of traffic. Yep. But how many actual devices were using IPv6 of the 341? Um, I don't have them in our uh, statistics here, but I can include it uh, in the presentation and we can upload it later because we have um, some statistics from the controller and also NetFlow that we can achieve this. But I didn't include it in this presentation. And also, I was happy to do this presentation tomorrow that we can collect more statistics until the end of the conference, but lightning talk is today. So 
all statistics that I provided is until today. Yes? Uh, yeah, please. Uh, I'm curious about uh, uh, what kind of security protection you provided for the conference network. So I believe uh, it would be a shame if we are having a conference in APNIC and then we got some DDoS attack from some, some naughty students and then our network just crashed. So what protection are you providing? So uh, of course uh, we implemented um, Firewall rules in our um, core router. We have um, um, ACL for border network. We have ACL for our SNMP and for our management and infra network. We separated our infra network that we are using for webcasting with the guest network and um, yeah, so many monitoring tools to catch the uh, any suspicious traffic. Yeah. Um, just a question, uh, how, how paranoid are the users? Um, uh, do you see a lot of VPN traffic? I mean, my own, net, my own notebook's on VPN all the time, yeah. but I'm a bit of a tinfoil hat guy. So just wondering if you, could, if you could say, I mean, if you could share some numbers on that, thank you. How many VPN users, you uh, mean? Oh, it, how many VPN in general, or sort of how paranoid are the users here in general? I mean, is it a lot of encrypted VPN or not too much? Um, again, so I can, I can provide this information uh, from the profiling that uh, we enable in, a, in the controller and we are capturing it. I can provide this information, but I don't have them at the moment. So maybe I can uh, include all of these information that you need in my slide and upload it later, maybe tomorrow, that you can have a look on that. Yes? So any question? So this question is related to your previous talk. Yes. So are you <laughs> planning to provide an IPv6 only Wi-Fi network in future APNIC meeting? Um, <laughs> it's a difficult question. So it's it's achievable. It's achievable, but um, we need to consider challenges that we may face during that time. So uh, I believe by uh, implementing IPv6 only Wi-Fi in our production network uh, that we are using, we can uh, capture all of the issues or most of the issues that we may face and we can use that experience to implement the IPv6 only network for APNIC conferences. Okay, so maybe allow me to modify my proposal. So maybe not IPv6 only uh, for the entire period. Um, we can try to choose one or two hours, uh, which is IPv6 only. And we, maybe we do not announce it to people and we, let's see whether people will notice that. Yeah, I have another suggestion. I can, um, I, um, I can say that we can have different SSID for IPv6 network that people can connect and we can uh, capture uh, issues that we may face for that. Yeah, we can use separate society for that. Any other question? Uh, I would like to ask Mark to come here. Um, Mark from TWNIC to say him thank you for all of his help. Yes? It's, yeah. Mark, get on stage. He helped us a lot during the site visit, before the conference, during the conference, and I would like to say thanks. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Shakayak. Um, I think <laughs> this concludes this session, and we are right on time. It's a perfect ending uh, for this session, and please do, don't forget to come back, because at uh, 4 p.m. there are another session here, another there. I forgot the topic, I didn't memorize. <laughs> so uh, go enjoy your afternoon tea break and uh, come back later. Thank you.